Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, is a name that uh, many of you know. Stories about uh, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, right? Hmm. Samuel Clemens was a writer of great charm and wit, and he could communicate important insights in a way that won him many admirers. On one of his trips abroad, the emperor of Germany sent an invitation for Twain to come and visit him and the royal family at the palace. When Twain's seven-year-old daughter heard about this, she said, oh, daddy, you know almost everybody in the whole wide world. Everybody, that is, except God. Everybody except God out of the mouth of babes, as they say. Our lesson for this morning contains an invitation for us to know God. But before we get to that, let's do a little uh, background on this story. Well, once upon a time, according to 1 Samuel, once upon a time there was a certain man named Elkanah who had two wives, that makes an interesting story right from the start, doesn't it? Mm. The two wives were named Peninnah and Hannah. Now, Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. And this was the cause of, of great friction between the two of them. You see, in those days, women were valued primarily for their fertility, for their ability to have children. And a barren wife, a wife that didn't have any children, was seen as a liability. And thus Peninnah, being a bit catty, never let Hannah forget that she, Peninnah, had given Elkanah several children, while Hannah had given him none. None. Well. Hannah's despair grew so great over this that she wept and refused to eat anything. Elkanah tried to comfort Hannah by reassuring her of his love. But even that couldn't fill the void, the sense of emptiness and failure that Hannah felt. In her own eyes and in the eyes of her society, Hannah was a failure because she didn't have any children. But being a deeply religious woman, Hannah took her problem and her despair to God. When she arrived at the temple at Shiloh, she knelt to pray, and Eli the priest was there. Eli saw Hannah weeping bitterly, and after some confusion at the beginning, and finally hearing her story, and hearing that Hannah had promised God that if God would give her a son, Hannah would give the boy fully to God. The old priest blessed Hannah and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you your request. Well, within the next year, Samuel was born, an answer to his mother's devout prayer. When Samuel was three years old, Hannah remembered her promise to God, and she brought young Samuel to the temple and left him with Eli the priest. Eli raised Samuel as his own son, and once a year, Hannah would go and see her son and, and would bring him gifts that she had made. Now, of course, there, there's much, much more to this wonderful story. But I wanted to refresh your memory and, and to set the scene, to set the scene of today's lesson, that critical night in Samuel's life when he first came to know God, when God first became real for him. If you'd like to follow along, the lesson is in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. And I'm reading this from a compilation of four different translations. Listen to this story. When the boy Samuel was serving the Lord 
under the direction of Eli the priest, there were very few messages from the Lord, and visions from the Lord were very rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was, was sleeping in his own room. The sanctuary lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the temple near the ark of God, the ark of the covenant. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel jumped up and ran to the old priest. Yes, sir, he said. You called me. Here I am. But Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. Then the Lord called again. Samuel, Samuel. Again, Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. To Eli. Yes, sir, he said. You called me. Here I am. But again, Eli said, no. No, my son, I, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. Now, all of this happened before Samuel knew God for himself. For the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now the Lord called a third time. Samuel, Samuel. Once again, Samuel jumped up and ran to the old priest. Yes, sir, he said. You called me. Here I am. Then it dawned upon Eli. He realized that it was the Lord who was calling Samuel. So Eli said to the boy, go back to bed. And if the voice calls you again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. Then the Lord came and called, just as he had before. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Great story. The question is, can you remember a time that was like that in your life? A time when, when God became so real for you. Can you remember? For some of you, it happened at a youth rally, didn't it? For others of you, it happened at, at a church camp, or through a Sunday school class, or through a small group. For, for some of you, it happened through a parent or a grandparent, through a girlfriend or a boyfriend. The point is, whenever it happened for you, However it happened for you, what's important is that it happened. God spoke to you in a very real way. And no longer was God just a story in a dusty old book. No. Now God was real. Very real. In Samuel's case, he was still a boy. He was lying in bed, remember? Remember? When suddenly he heard a voice, Samuel, Samuel. And thinking that Eli had called him, Samuel ran to the old priest and said, Here I am. But Eli had not called Samuel, had he? And so he sent Samuel back to bed. This happened two more times. And finally, after the third time, after the third time, it begins to dawn on the old priest that the voice Samuel was hearing was God's voice. So this time, Eli tells Samuel, go lie down. And if the voice calls you again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Can you even begin to imagine <laughs> how excited how scared, how confused young Samuel must have felt at this point. But he went and lay down. And he waited. And he waited. And then the voice came again. Samuel, Samuel. And with his heart racing and his body rigid with uncertainty, young Samuel answered, 
Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And God did speak. Words that changed Samuel's life forever. Now, friends, I pray that you came here this morning not just out of habit. I pray that you came here this morning not just out of loyalty to the Bridgeway Church. I pray that you came here this morning not just because of some family member or friend, important as all that is. I pray that you came here this morning instead with the intention of listening to God speak to you. That you came with a spirit of expectancy. That you came knowing that today could be a life-changing experience for you. After all, that does happen from time to time, doesn't it? People who have been spiritually blind for years can suddenly see. People who have been sitting in darkness their whole life long can suddenly see a light. People who have known nothing but defeat after defeat after defeat are suddenly aware of a great victory in their life. And by God's amazing grace, through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it has happened to others. And by God's amazing grace, through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it can also happen to you. Just like it did young Samuel. And just like Samuel, three things. Three things must be present for us to come to know God. First of all, we must have a believing heart of faith. We must have a believing heart of faith. All of us know that life can make us cynical, right? That's why Jesus said it was easier for children to experience the kingdom of God than for us shell-shocked adults. I mean, so often our lives become encrusted, don't they? Encrusted with, with layers of negative experiences. Encrusted with layers of self-serving rationalizations. Encrusted with unrealized expectations encrusted sad but but true Samuel at this stage in his life was more open to God's leading than perhaps he would have been later on in his life and obviously this has much to say to us about the importance of the many children's and youth ministries within this church ministries such as Sunday school vacation Bible school retreats activity times, mission trips, church camp experiences, and the list goes on and on. But the truth is that, that none of us, none of us are too old to have a believing heart of faith. Faith is simply a matter of letting go and trusting God. Letting go and trusting God. It's like the story of the man who descended into a deep, dark, dry well by sliding down a rope, a rope which was supposed to be long enough to let him reach the bottom of the well safely. But to the man's dismay, he came to the end of the rope before his feet touched the dark bottom of the well. And as he, as he hung there, he realized that he, he didn't have enough strength to climb back up the rope. And he was afraid of letting go and dropping, not knowing how, how far down the bottom of the well was. And so he, he held on tightly with all of his might until all of his strength was, was gone. And then he dropped. He dropped down to the bottom of the well which was just three inches below his feet. Three inches 
to the safe rock bottom. Some of us, my friends, some of us are just like that man. We're just three inches from fully trusting God. We're just three inches from that closer relationship with him. We're just three inches from singing and meaning and believing the words that the praise team led us in this morning. Just three inches away from safety. But instead of having that trust, instead of having that, that closer relationship, instead of walking with him, we're using all of our energy, our time, our talent, and our gifts to hang on tightly to our doubts and our fears. We don't want to let go. We hang on tightly. You see, before we can hear God speak in our lives, before we can know him as Savior, Lord, and King, and before he can become real to us, we, like Samuel, must have that, that believing heart of faith. Secondly, if we want to know God the way Samuel did, we must also have a listening ear. A listening ear. Just as Eli the priest advised Samuel to lie down and listen, so too we must listen for God in our lives. Back in 1903, there was a young man who saw a help wanted ad for a telegraph operator. The young man had, had studied Morse code at home while he was unemployed. And so he decided to try out for the job. His heart sank, however, as he entered the waiting room. For the room was full of other men, all seeking that same one job. The young man found a corner and sat down on the floor. All the chairs were, were full of other men. He was feeling hopeless and de dejected. Suddenly, he jumped to his feet, ran into the manager's office, and within a few minutes, the manager appeared at the door, announcing to all the others that the job had been filled by this young man. One of the other men who had waited patiently all morning for an interview asked the manager, so what did this guy say? that landed him the job. After all, he was the last one here. What did he say? And the manager looked at him and all the other men in the room and said, it was nothing that he said. You see, all morning I've been tapping out a message on my office door in Morris Code. The message was, if you can understand this message, come on in. You're hired. <laughs> all of you, the manager said, all of you heard the noise. But this man, this man was the only one who truly listened. Likewise, it's got to be frustrating for God to try to speak to us when we simply won't take the time to listen. When we won't share a few moments of our day with him to listen. In truth, my friends, God has already been speaking to us this morning. Through our songs that we sang with the praise team. Through our prayer time. Through the sharing of his holy word. And through the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. But the question is, how many of us have truly been listening? How many of us have truly been listening? If we want God to speak to us, we have to be willing to be quiet. To pause in our busy day. To listen. We must have that listening ear. 
Thirdly, if we want to know God the way Samuel did, we must have obedient hands. Obedient hands. Remember when Samuel went back to bed and waited for God to speak, and finally God did speak? What did Samuel say? He said, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Your servant. One reason that many of us refuse to give in to the impulse of faith. One reason that many of us refuse to follow God's voice in our life. One reason that many of us refuse to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ is that such a step would lead us to a true commitment of our lives. Not just our our Sunday morning lives, but our total lives. Not just our devotional time life, but our total life. Giving it all to God and his service. (laughs) And quite frankly, that scares many of us, doesn't it? I mean, we couldn't stand not being in charge of our own life, could we? But isn't that what being a faithful, committed disciple of Jesus Christ is all about? Hmm? Isn't it about not being in charge? Isn't it about following the lead of the Holy Spirit? Back in 1947, there was a missionary who was home on leave in Chicago. Sitting by her second-story window, she opened her mail, one letter, and to her surprise, a crisp $20 bill fell out. Now, that was a lot of money back in 1947, especially for this, this, this missionary. The missionary was pleasantly surprised to see that, but but then she noticed, looking out her window, she noticed a shabbily dressed man on the street below her. Thinking that he must be in greater financial distress than herself, and remembering how Jesus told his followers to help those in need, and that it's more, and that it's more blessed to give than to receive. The missionary slipped the $20 bill into an envelope and wrote on the outside, don't despair. And then she threw the envelope out the window at the man below. The man picked up the envelope, read it, and looked up and smiled, tipped his hat, and walked off. The next day, there was a knock on the missionary's door. Opening the door, she saw the same shabbily dressed man. And smiling, he handed her a large roll of money. What's this all about, she asked. Well, the man said, this is the money you won. Your horse, don't despair, paid 15 to 1. (laughs) Now, obviously, friends, obviously an act of Christian love An act of Christian service, an act of Christian commitment doesn't always pay off 15 to 1. Sometimes it's much, much more than that, isn't it? And that's what obedient hands are all about, as some of you well know. Yes, Samuel had a believing heart of faith. He had a listening ear for God's voice in his life. And he had obedient hands for doing God's work, for being God's servant. And thus Samuel became one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. And the truth is, friends, we can live just like Samuel. We don't have to dangle helplessly three inches from the ground. For we can have a believing heart of faith. And we don't have to be overwhelmed by the noise and racket of the world. For we can also have listening ears. Listening for God's voice in our life. Listening for the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
And we don't have to be trying to run our own life to be in charge all the time. We can instead be obedient servants of Christ, saying, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Speak, Lord. Your servant will obey. And that's our challenge, isn't it? To believe, to listen, to obey. Three simple steps of faith that can lead to a lifetime of knowing and loving God and can lead to a lifetime of being known and being loved by God. What could be better than that? As the praise team comes forward, let me offer you a few words of encouragement. Some of you sitting here this morning and some of you listening online, you want to know more about this believing heart of faith. You want to know more about that listening ear. You want to know more about what obedient hands are all about. What would that look like in my life, you ask? What would that look like? The pastors at this church the lay leaders at this church are more than willing to sit down with you and talk about it with you, have a prayer with you, and lead you on that path of having a believing heart of faith. To lead you on that path of, of having that listening ear, of, of having those obedient hands that you may have that very special relationship, that very special life, just like young Samuel had. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, awaken us to your voice. Help us to have that believing heart of faith Help us, Holy Spirit, to have that, that listening ear for you in our life. Help us to have those obedient hands that will do your work. Help us to be open to learning more about that, to talking with others and, and praying about that for our life. Help us, Lord, to be your people, in your holy name we pray. Amen. You can stand.
sing a little 